there are some things that are kind of like cute to learn and understand, and then there are some things that are super important, and one of them is the normal probability distribution. Almost all the time when, uh, when they take these presidential surveys of small samples and then they try to extrapolate it, uh, there's some sort of normal distribution involved. And you know, usually when you're trying to look at uh, the way in which things are distributed in their length or their weight, um, you know, the IQ distribution of people in the country, grades, I mean, there's so many examples. The normal probability distribution pops up everywhere. It just, it's kind of ingrained into the fabric of the world we live in, is sort of the way you need to think about it. So um, I'm going to outline what it is with a practical example, draw a picture. I'm not going to draw much on the board. It's mostly going to be a lecture. I'll draw a picture to show you what it looks like. And then we'll kind of compare and contrast it to what we learned in the last section when we also got introduced to these probability distributions. So let's say you go to the supermarket and you pick a, a watermelon. Now there's a whole giant shelf of watermelon. Maybe there's a giant, you know, uh, uh, fenced off area where they've got like 200 watermelons. And you randomly pick one. So you don't really look at it, you just close your eyes and you grab one. All right. Now you know that there are watermelons of all different shapes and sizes. Uh, but you also know that watermelons can't be as big as a truck, right? And watermelons, unless they're baby watermelons, they're not going to be like as small as a ping pong ball. I'm not talking about babies. I'm talking about adult mature watermelons that are in the grocery store ready for you to pick. So what we call mature watermelons. Let's say you pick one of these guys at random and then you get a tape measure and you measure its length from end to end along its longest direction. And you measure that length and you record that number. Right, and then let's go. Let's say you go back and do that again, and get a second watermelon, and then you get another watermelon. All randomly, each time you do it randomly, you get a, a result that is its basically its length. So you could say the random variable here that we care about is the length of the watermelon, because the experiment I'm doing every time is randomly grabbing a watermelon and measuring its length. The outcome of the experiment, which we're calling our random variable x is how long that thing is. Now we know that we're never gonna get, almost never gonna get the exact same length. Even if they look like they're pretty close, they're probably gonna differ by a fraction of an inch or a very small amount. But we also know that if we look at hundreds or thousands or maybe millions of watermelons, that there will be some trends. We're gonna figure out that most of the watermelons are gonna have an average length around a certain value. Right? And we know that some watermelons are going to be a little bit bigger than that, and some watermelons are going to be a little bit smaller than that, but still, there'll be an average value, and most of the watermelons will cluster around that. Now, you may have the crazy watermelon that's giant compared to the average, and you may have the, also the crazy watermelon that's a, a puny little watermelon compared to the average, but still, there'll be an average value, much like grades in a room, there's an average value of the grades. Some kids are going to get hundreds or 95s, some kids are going to get 66s, but there'll be an average value. But getting back to our watermelon, if we want to represent the spread of these watermelons, or I should say maybe the probability of drawing a watermelon with a certain length, we can draw it um, in terms of what we call a normal distribution. We say that the lengths of these watermelons are normally distributed. So in a problem in statistics, if you see something is normally distributed, you automatically know it's going to have the shape that I'm going to draw on the board. And so let me show you that right now. This is called the normal. And it has such a powerful name like normal because it's, it's the one that's so common everywhere, the normal distribution. And in fact, it's a normal probability distribution really is what it is. So let's go ahead and draw that. So here we have an axis here. All right. And I will draw a vertical guy here. And I'll do my best to draw, but you know, I'm not a perfect artist here. Now for our watermelon, we're going to say that the um, average length, if we took a sample of a million watermelons, million perfectly ripe farm fresh watermelons. Let's just say the average of the length is 20 inches. 20 inches. So we'll put that there because it's 20 inches. Now obviously some watermelons are going to be bigger than that. That's going to be this direction. So I'll, I'll say this is the length in inches. Some watermelons will be uh, longer than that and some will be shorter than that. So we might have some that are 25 inches and we might have some that are 30 inches, and we also might have some that are 15 inches, and we might have some that are 10 inches, and we may have some really dwarf watermelons that are even smaller, but most of them are gonna be right at the average. That's what the average value is. So I'll put 
Here I'll put this is the average, or as we call the mean. We've been talking about the average value in statistics. We call that the mean of the population of watermelons in the world. Okay. So then we want to see what this looks like. The normal probability distribution looks something like this. It goes like this, and it does not touch the axis here. Notice that it comes down. It does not touch the axis, but it kind of goes like an S like this. It gets closer and closer and closer to the axis, but it never really touches it. And I'll do my best to be symmetric, but I'm probably not going to do a great job. So this goes down like this and this goes down like this. So that's actually not a bad job. What this is supposed to show you is a perfectly symmetrical distribution. I kind of screwed it up a little bit up there, but you get the basic idea. This goes up like this. So what you are looking at whenever you look at a normal distribution like this is here's the mean value of the length of the watermelon. So you can kind of think of this axis right here being sort of like the probability, right? The probability. So you can look at this and say, hey, what's the probability of getting a 20? Well, it seems to be a maximum. So by looking at that normal distribution, I can see that if I randomly draw a watermelon, I'm most likely going to get somewhere around 20. Now, as I get a little bit farther away from 20, I've still got a pretty high probability. But as I get farther and farther away from 20, the probability falls off as, as this bell curve. You may have heard of a bell curve. That's what it is. So when you see normal distribution, or normally distributed, or bell-shaped, bell-curved. It's all referring to the same thing. It's all referring to this graph right here, basically. So you can see a few things about this. So this curve represents kind of like the probability of, of sort of selecting these different values, for lack of a better word. The highest probability is always going to happen around the mean because that's where most of your, by definition, if it's the mean value, then you know a large part of your population is going to be right around that value of the mean. So the probability of getting a watermelon right around this is pretty high. Anywhere right around the mean is pretty high. As you get farther from the mean, the probability gets lower and lower. Eventually, if you get so far away, this graph goes so close to the axis, the probability effectively becomes very close to zero. If I get really, if I get 55 or 85 inches way down off the chart, probability is going to get super close to zero. All right, so that's the, the deal with statistics. If I get really far this way, less than 10 inches, let's say, probability is going to get really far to zero, close to zero. So there's a couple of things I want to make sure. I'm going to hit the, the bullet points here as we talk about this. So the first one's obvious. It's called the normal probability distribution. Number two, this is called continuous. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to say this is a continuous distribution. Notice, what is the difference between this and what we had on the board in the last lesson? The last lesson, the experiment was totally different. We threw coins. We only had certain kinds of results that could happen. Zero heads, one heads, two heads, or three heads. There was no in-between. But with watermelons, we all know it's possible that, that they could be 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 or 35 inches, but they could also be any length in between. The possibility is there for a watermelon to have any number of lengths. So it's, it's not discrete anymore, it's called continuous. And in real life, almost everything is a continuous probability distribution that's going to look like this kind of curve, and that's why we study it so much in statistics. All right, number three, the random variable x is the length of the watermelon. So that's what we call the random variable x. We already kind of said that. We do the experiment, pull the watermelon. Random variable is what we're talking about here, we graph. Uh, the normal curve that we have on here is uh, symmetric about this axis. I haven't drawn it perfectly symmetric, but if you were to fold a sheet of paper and kind of draw the other side, it should look absolutely symmetric on both sides. And it's bell-shaped. We talked about that. The uh, number five here is extremely important. It's completely, this graph is completely defined by the mean of the population of watermelons and the standard deviation of the length of those, popula of, uh, those watermelons. So I'm going to write that down here. So uh, the normal distribution completely defined by the mean, which if you remember from volume one, we talked a lot about the mean, the, the average length of these watermelons, and the standard deviation of the length of these watermelons. We represent that as lowercase sigma like that. Um, what I'm trying to say is all of the normal distributions, they all look bell-shaped. 
but some of them are going to be fatter, some of them are going to be tall and skinnier, and so on. And also, they, they might be centered, the reason it's centered around 20 is because the, the average value we're just saying in this particular example is around 20, but I may have cantaloupes or something else, the average value may not be 20 for anything else. If we were looking at cucumbers, the average length of cucumbers might be more like 14 inches or something. So the uh, shape and where it's placed is going to be completely defined by the mean, which is going to show you where the peak is, and the standard deviation, which is going to show you how fat this curve is. We're going to get to a little bit more about how that works in, in the next section, but I want to just tell you that you pick a value of the mean and a value of the standard deviation, and you completely lock down what your bell curve looks like or what your normal distribution looks like. Very important thing I want to show you here uh, for the next guy here. This, this should blow your mind a little bit here. Total area under curve, meaning under this normal distribution curve, is equal to, if you had to guess, what do you think it would, it would be equal to? It would be equal to 1. Because if you think about it, we talked about the discrete probability distributions before, and we said we covered all outcomes, so when you add all the probabilities up, you should get 1, because there's only a certain number of ways in which that experiment can end or unfold, and so by showing that they're all equal to 1, if you add them up, we've covered all outcomes. Well, this is representing all possible outcomes of pulling watermelons. Sometimes we'll get 20, sometimes we'll get 15, less likely. Sometimes we'll get 30, that's less likely. We're covering the probability distribution of all possible lengths. So if we want to figure out, if, if the height of this curve is sort of representing the probability, the relative probability of getting a, a watermelon, then if we find the area under the curve, it's like, it's like adding up all of the little heights, if you think about it. The heights under this curve plus the next one plus the next one plus the next one. You're getting the area under this curve. We're getting into a little bit of calculus, but the idea is the area under this curve is like adding up the vertical length touching this graph next and the one next to it and the one next to it and the one next to it and the one next to it. And you add all those together, all those probabilities, you're getting the area under the curve. So in probability or in statistics, when you have any kind of probability distribution that's continuous like this, the area under the curve is always, always, always going to add up to be one because we're trying to cover all possible outcomes, all possible lengths. Everything we can get from watermelon land is going to sum up and be covered by this curve, so it has to be equal to 1 because this represents the probability and we add everything up and it has to be equal to 1. Next thing I want to show you, this curve here, I mentioned it before, it does not touch the x-axis. It goes asymptotically, which means it almost touches, but it never quite gets down to that axis. So that is a probability distribution, the most important one that you'll ever study, and the one that governs 90% of everything you'll do in statistics. Um, now, I want to show you something. We've drawn it. We've talked about it. We, I think you kind of have an idea of what it's for. If we haven't done any problems yet. But by this point, you should understand what it represents, what it means. Even if you haven't worked with it yet, you should have that kind of thing. Now, we said that probability distributions can be represented in table form, like we did before, in graph form, also in terms of a formula. Now, this graph, just like any graph from algebra, can be written down in terms of a formula. Uh, I want to show you what that is. So this is the formula, or the equation, for the normal distribution. And it's, it's pretty cool. We're not going to use it much. I'll explain why in a minute. But I want to show it to you. So f of x, in other words, the graph here, is equal to 1 over, this is the standard deviation sigma, times the square root of 2 pi, times e, this is that special number e, to the minus x minus the mean, that's mu, squared, divided by 2 sigma squared. This is an exact representation of what this is a drawing of on the board. All right, so this is the formula for the normal distribution. So depending on what class you're taking in statistics, you might study this in detail and use it a lot, um, or you may not use it at all. But I want to illustrate it for you so that you at least know that this equation, that this graph here doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's represented by a very special equation, which is this right here. E is that special number, 2.71 and a bunch of decimals after it. Uh, it's related to the logarithm on your calculator, if you've studied logarithms in my, in my classes. 
And if you think about it, what I guess what I'm trying to tell you is if you, if you stick this equation into a calculator or a computer and you plot it, you will get a shape that looks like this bell curve, right? And it's not obvious at first. You can't look at this and just know that. I mean, if you're looking at that and you don't understand it or if you're like, I have no idea that looks like a bell curve, that's cool. I don't expect you to look at this and just know that. I'm just telling you that. Now let me show you here. Even though it looks very complicated, I want to make sure you understand. 2 is just a number. Pi is just a number. Taking the square root of those things is just going to give you a number. So this thing right here is just a number. E is just a number. You're raising it to the power of negative, and then inside the exponent, um, what you have is sigma, which is your standard deviation, and then you have the mean, and then you have x here, and you have standard deviation down here. So if you look down here, Notice I told you, the normal distribution is completely defined by the mean and the standard deviation. What I'm trying to tell you is, this represents the normal distribution. If you put a standard deviation for here and here and put the mean in here, everything else in this equation is just a number. I mean, think about it. If I tell you standard deviation of 2 and a mean of 5, those are just numbers. So if I knew that, then I would put there's a number, 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 and there's a number. Once I lock down the mean and the standard deviation, everything in this entire equation is just a number, except for x, right? And that's because you're plotting it. So the way you would do that is you would dump this in your calculator. All of these would be numbers, all of this stuff would be numbers, except for, of course, x, which is what you're plotting against, right? And then if you plot that guy, you get a bell curve. So for those of you who have a nice graphing calculator or a computer that you like to use, I actually kind of encourage you to do that. Just take this equation and pick anything you want. Pick standard deviation of 1 and pick a mean, which is this one, of 1. That's easy, right? Or even pick a mean of 0 if you want, okay? And then what's going to happen is everything in this equation is going to reduce to a number except for this and you plot it uh, for all values of x and then what you're going to get is a graph that looks like this, all right? Um, we don't use this very much in statistics though, or at least not in introductory statistics, because in the back of your textbook, whatever book you're using, you have a table of values that calculates the different values along this bell curve. Notice that I said before um, that usually you're interested in the area under the curve, and I told you the area under the curve is equal to 1 if you add up all the area under the curve. Well, it turns out later on in later sections, we're going to be very interested in finding the area under this curve. Not just for the whole curve, but we might want to find the area between two parts or whatever. And you'll see as we get there that we're going to be very interested in calculating the area under the, in, under the normal curve. It's going to be how we calculate answers to our problems. If we didn't have any tables, we would have to calculate the area using the actual formula. And the way you have to do that is with calculus. So I'm not going to get into that right now because a lot of you taking statistics have not taken calculus. But for those of you that have, if you remember, calculus, about half of calculus is all learning about how to find area under the curve. Right? And there's ways to do that in calculus. So if you were in a more advanced statistics class, or if, um, just depending on your professor, you might use calculus methods to calculate the area using this guy. But for everybody else in the world, and 99% of statistics classes, what you're going to end up doing is using the table of values in the back of your textbook to find the area under these bell curves. So I'm showing you this equation mostly to kind of open your eyes and show you that this does come from someplace. I also want to show you that the shape of the curve really is locked down be between the values of the mean and the standard deviation. If you change those values, you change the shape of the curve, but it always does look bell-shaped. That's the other reason I'm showing you this. And I'm also kind of just kind of trying to broaden you uh, and just kind of show you that, you know, hey, sometimes if you're using more advanced techniques, you might actually plug this in and use some calculus to find the answers. But in almost all cases, we don't need to do that because in the back of your textbook, it's tabulated what the areas under these curves really are. And so that's what we're going to use 99% of the time. So as we move forward, we're not going to look at this very much at all. But what we are going to do is use the concept of, hey, we have this normal distribution. It's very important. The area under the curve is very important for finding probability of outcomes. And then we're going to use the tables in the back of the textbook to find those answers um, there. So this is an introduction to the normal distribution. Follow me on to the next section where I'll draw a few more pictures and I'll show you how the mean and the standard deviation, when you change them, changes the shape of the normal distribution. But no matter what values you choose, it always looks bell-shaped like it does here. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.